If you would like to open your Bibles to 3 John, uh, you can do so, and when you're ready uh, for the reading and in honor of God's Word, you can stand to your feet or stay standing if you still are. Um, I will tell you, I, I officially owe my wife another cup of coffee. I was thoroughly convinced uh, because 3 John is actually the shortest Bible in the, or shortest book in the entire Bible. Um, I was convinced this is going to be a one Sunday study for sure. And then this morning was reading over it, praying over it, and uh, it became clear that's not true. It's going to, we're going to take our time and soak up the whole thing. Every word is a good word. So uh, Third John, we're going to read the whole thing, but the focus of our study today will be the first eight verses, so you can kind of uh, attune your mind to that. But let's read and pray and grow, starting in verse 1. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. For I rejoiced greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you, just as you walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers who have borne witness of your love before the church. If you send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God, you do well, because they went forth for his name's sake, taking nothing from the Gentiles. We, therefore, ought to receive such that we may become fellow workers for the truth. Verse 9, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among you, does not receive us. Therefore, if I come, I will call to mind his deeds, which he does, pratting against us with malicious words. And not content with that, he himself does not receive the brethren and forbids those who wish to, putting them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. He who does good is of God, but he who does evil has not seen God. Demetrius, that's our third person here, has a good testimony from all and from the truth itself, and we also bear witness, and you know that our testimony is true. I had many things to write, but I do not wish to write with pen and ink. But I hope to see you shortly, and we shall speak face to face. Peace to you. Our friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. Lord, what a precious, precious piece of Scripture. I ask that you'd prepare our hearts for this, Lord, our minds for this, and we'd be encouraged, challenged, if need be, rebuked, but Lord, we'd be found a little less of ourselves today and more like Christ. In his name we pray. We all said, amen. amen. Church, you can have a seat. Uh, if somehow you are unaware or have forgotten that the church is full of sinners saved by grace... This is a piece of scripture that reminds us we're still going through the sanctification or the refinement process. You have a younger man than, than John named Gaius here, and as he's very, very busy about church work, whether he's the leader or just one of the leaders, it's not exactly clear his role, but influential nonetheless, he's getting pretty beat up by this gentleman in the church who was all about himself. He wanted the preeminence. He wanted the position of prestige. He wanted the title. In fact, you learn now, and we'll focus next week on his folly, but he was so desiring a position of recognition and, and of fame and the spotlight that anyone that would like someone else was put out. No, 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 you can only give to my ministry. No, 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 you can only promote my teachings. No, 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 you can't disagree with me. And if you do, you are actually removed from fellowship. One of the worst things I could possibly imagine, and yet there are places on the planet near and far that still act the same way from time to time. It's very sad. Now, just because someone can speak confidently doesn't mean they're being like Christ. And just because you can wrap it in biblical phraseology doesn't mean your stance is biblical. 
And so you have this divisive man who's self-seeking, putting himself in a position of power that really is not his to be had. And you have Gaius. You find this precious man in the church who John loves. He says, man, you are my beloved. The, the word means you're my dearest friend. My heart so cares for you. When it refers to him as my children or one of my children, the idea is he's probably got led to salvation in Christ through John himself. And that he watched him grow over time and mature in his faith. And he says, look, I love you kind of like how Paul referred to Timothy as his son in the faith. The apostle John, now so much older, outlived Peter and Paul by 30 years, pen in hand, this is my dearest friend. I know you're getting pounded on by this guy who's all about himself, but people have come. They have come back or they're visiting from where you live. And I've heard about you. You're doing it right. Keep going. Don't stop. If you were to compare 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, it's interesting how they go from a, a large audience all the way down to a very, very personable one. Now, 1 John was to the churches, multiple churches in the region of Ephesus, and it was written and to be handed and, and sifted around groups of churches. 2 John was to a group of people at a church, the elect lady and those who were fellowshipping in her home. And so 1 John, big audience, group of churches. 2 John, a group of people at a church. 3 John is so personal as it is written to a single person within the church. Very heartfelt, very pointed, very intentional. Now, it's interesting. Second and third John almost deal with the same issue, but in two different experiences. If you compare them, the first one deals with generosity, but being careful that you're not feeding the wolves, so to say. Be careful you're not funding false doctrine, that you're not supporting bad teachers and missionaries. And so it deals with false teachers, or it, it says to watch out for the wolves. Third John's the opposite. He says, give out of a generous heart and support the good shepherds. So second John is a warning about the wolves. Third John is an exhortation to take care of those shepherds who are doing a good job. Now, the first four verses, we want to look at this together quickly, but effectively, and it's the difficulty and drama that had arisen through Diotrephus. He's giving Gaius and others a hard time, threatening him. And no doubt, Gaius, you better stop. You better stop. I see what you remember the guys I had to kick out of church last time? You're next. Look, the tables should be turned. It's a guy like Diotrephes, if he won't receive correction and rebuke, ought to step aside for a moment until he comes to a reckoning with the Lord. And instead, he's threatening a godly guy in an ungodly way. And so you have older John, and may every one of us who's been walking with the Lord five, eight, ten years or more, take note ju not just at what John says, but what he's doing. Imagine you're Gaius, and here you are, discouraged, getting beat up for doing the right thing, out of your own pocket being generous to those who are preaching the name of Christ. And you're being pushed down and threatened for it. And then you get a letter from the Apostle John. It says, hey, my dearest friend. Oh. It probably didn't take much to encourage him. A good word from a distant land can refresh the bones so quickly. And he makes three statements, and this is what we ought to do in the lives of either young believers or people new to the faith and so young in their walk. These three things of reassurance, supplications, celebration, and continuation. It's verse 2, 3, and 4 here, the, the supplications. He says, I pray that you prosper in all that you do and in your health the way that your soul prospers. It's like, well, how does my soul prosper? continuously refreshed by the Lord. The very word to prosper, it means I pray the road is smooth or the sailing is sweet, that the weather is good for you, that things would be going well. Sometimes just someone knowing you've got their back is all they needed to know. Hey, what? I love you. Oh, when's the last time you told somebody, hey, I've got your back. Hey, 
you're doing a good job. Hey, you're running your race. And this older man, John, takes the ink and puts it to paper and says, Gaius, I pray, my supplications, my prayers for you is that your soul, I know your soul as well, right? The outward body is perishing, but the inward's being renewed day by day. I pray the same thing, that your livelihood, your occupation, God will be blessing your occupation and your health. Do we encourage people or do we come along looking, sniffing out for the gossip that is so fun to listen to but so destructive to our relationships? Well, John is saying, look, I pray you are well. The supplication. Then there's the celebration. And I know the pendulum can swing way too far in either direction. Some people, it's just, it's a party every day. Like, wow, that's crazy. But... If the pendulum was to swing so far in the other direction, the church looks more like stale bread. Something's wrong to celebrate who we are in the Lord. Look, is he not the King of kings and the Lord of lords? The one who was and is and is to come. I was dead. I don't know about you. I was dead in my trespasses and sins, but now am alive through Christ. And that's not like an allegorical thing. It's the truth. I was on, were you not on the broad road that leads to destruction, guaranteed to inherit eternal judgment in the flames of hell? Yeah, I mean, I can almost smell the embers. And then God plucked you up and put you on the narrow path, renewing you, making you a new creation in Christ. Praise the Lord, brother. <laughs> what? What? No way. No way. And when we see younger people in the faith, or to be honest, co-anything, it doesn't matter age, but especially Gaius now, younger than John, newer in the faith than John, being encouraged and celebrated the, the affirmation. And look, I know the temptation, and I think there's some wisdom to it, but as a family of God here, can we be less careful in this particular area? And I don't mean go crazy. But you know, Josh did announcements, and you're like, Josh did a good job. I, I want to tell Josh he did a good job on announcements, but I don't want to go to his head. <laughs> I, I know. And I've actually watched people become arrogant and disqualified because they did announcements well. It's very sad. But 99 out of 100 guys are not walking around like, <laughs> I am the best announcer. <laughs> And so if someone does a decent job, if you come to first service ever, and you're like, how are you out here greeting with a smile in the dark? I'm not even smiling. Tell them, thank you. I love your smile in the mornings. Matches the stars. Wh whatever. I don't know. Well, I don't, I don't want them to become an arrogant greeter. Like, oh, I, I don't either. But if the other option is to withdraw encouragement and affirmation until they dry up and crumble, how sad. Someone's doing a good job with the kids or someone's refreshing the pot of coffee. Like, hey, thank you so much. Your hospitality is amazing. Encourage one another. And so the supplications, I pray that your life is going well and that God is blessing your occupation and your health the way he is the state of your soul. I want to celebrate what you're doing in the Lord. You're walking with him. And in fact, what he tells him here is people have come back with great reports of how you're doing. I have no greater joy. And that's the whole second piece, the continuation. I have no greater joy than to hear that you're walking with the Lord. Now, Maybe for some of you, this is the first church you've ever been to, you're a new believer, but for many, you probably have come from somewhere else at some point in your life, maybe even a different part of the country. If someone was to travel back on vacation and, and unknowingly go to the church you were at before, and they run into your pastor, and, and they're like, wait, where are you from? Oh my gosh, do you know Susie? Like, I do know Susie. What would they say about Susie? Oh, you pastored her? Man. She's always staring at the kids. She always honks at people in the parking lot. I know Susie. What kind of report would they bring? Or would it be, oh my goodness, Susie. 
that lady is so faithful and so kind and so hospitable, what would the report be? And John says, Gaius, you're not telling me how awesome you are. You're just staying faithful to, to fulfilling your father's business. But people have come and visited, and they've told me about you, how much you love the brethren, how generous you've been with your own stuff, how kind you are to those, whether it's the brethren or even the strangers. And I am rejoicing over you. I pray we are a church that is rejoicing over the goodness of God in the lives of others. I think it's fascinating. Diotrephes wanted to be well-known and loved. He, wa- he wanted the power. He wanted the, the prominence and prestige. He wanted to be well-known and loved. And what's funny is that Gaius actually was. Gaius is the one who's well-known. Gaius is the one who's loved. And he was never seeking the spotlight, let alone the limelight. The guy who wanted it, oh, he's known, but not for good. And so if we just put our hands to the plow and stay faithful, God will do whatever God wants to do. Now, I, I got to be honest, in my younger years of Christianity, I'd say even so far the majority of my earlier Christianity, I think I put too much emphasis and, and appreciation or I admired too, too much zeal, passion, talent, all those things. Yeah, man, that guy's so passionate, so zealous. He's on fire. And I've learned that over time, the qualities that are to be appreciated the most is not zeal and passion and personality. It's not the giftings. It's someone's capacity for faithfulness and commitment. Okay, cool, you can show up and and do something fantastic. But will you be there in a year? Will you be there in a decade? Will you be there at the end? And when he praises and encourages his faithfulness, he's not saying, wow, you're so talented. Wow, you're such a great preacher. Wow, he says, wow, you're still walking the walk. You're still continuing in faithfulness. You're still able to be counted on. Now, if we're discipling people, as the Great Commission implies that we ought to all the time, at whatever level, Anyone discipling someone younger in the faith than you, please infuse faithfulness into their character. All throughout Scripture, Jesus says, right, if you want to be faithful in much, you got to be faithful in the little stuff first. Infuse faithfulness into the lives of those that are younger than you. In 1 Corinthians, we're taught we're all to be considered stewards of God's Word, of the mysteries of God. And then the next thing it says is that stewards are to be found faithful. And so to infuse faithfulness where people can count on and rely on you just like Gaius refreshes and encourages John. How how, how do you sum up the idea of faithfulness, that stick to itness? Stick it out. Modern, Modern language, stick it out. Well, what if it's hard? Stick it out. What if it's easy? Why would you jump ship? Now look, some of us do. Some of it's it's going too well. I gotta leave before it crashes. Wow. Have any of you ever had a hard time when God was blessing your life? There's not many of us. I did it. I've done it. It's, you feel unworthy of His kindness. Remember, there's a about two year part of our life. We got to live in a house that was way bigger than we ever deserved. Like, it was awesome. And for a year and a half of the two years, every time I got home, I felt guilty for living there. This is too nice. We don't deserve this. We shouldn't be here. And I remember near the end of the year and a half, like, well, what changed your mind? I remember praying, Lord, again, for the 400th time in a row, pulling up, Lord, I, I don't deserve this. And I remember the conviction just fell in my mind. Sometimes fathers like to bless their kids. Sometimes fathers like to bless their kids. And it was two years, and the Lord changed the season, and the house shrank by 70%. It was awesome. We were selling furniture in the front yard because it wouldn't fit in the living room. And that's okay. But if you're in a season of blessing, enjoy it. If you're in a season of trial, endure it. But stick it out. 
All right? Now, real quick, you need to look at somebody and tell them, stick it out. Not like a wimpy stick it out. You're commissioning them. Stick it out. There you go. All right, we're not snowflakes. We can take it. Now, I'm going to say a couple questions or statements, and then the response is stick it out. You guys ready? Okay. Uh, when you don't like your boss. Oh, look at that. Oh, work so hard. Stick it out. My coworkers, stick it out. Uh, how about this one, right? Uh, there, there's brokenness in my friendship. Uh huh. Yep. Oh, uh, my marriage is falling apart. Uh, you better figure it out. Figure it out. My church hurt my feelings. You better look. Look. I don't even know what I did. Stick it out. <laughs> Amen. No, look, 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 think, 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 think. This is crazy. And of course, no one here has ever been hurt. I mean, for they're visiting. But no, someone, well, the greeter didn't smile at me. Like, oh, I know. Isn't it so hard? And I, don't, I do mean that kind of like your brother sarcastically, if I can get away with that. You guys understand. We're going to get to heaven and meet people who Hebrews says are not worthy of our presence. For their faith, they were sawn in two. While still alive, were sewn up into the skin of sheep and fed to lions who had their skin rolled off their body while they were still alive. And we're going to complain about what? That day is coming. Parking was hard. Parking was hard. <laughs> Stick it out. I have no greater joy. John the Apostle. Gaius, I know you're getting pounded on, man. But I've heard news of how you're doing, and you're doing well. I know it's hard. I know it's uphill. I know there's opposition. But I just want to encourage you. I pray for you that the Lord would cause you to prosper. And I absolutely want to celebrate and affirm, and I want to encourage you, keep walking the walk. In fact, I have no greater joy than to hear how well you're doing. And my prayer, church, as your brother in the Lord and your pastor, is that we would finish well together. And if for some reason God were to move you to Nebraska or Wyoming or wherever, then at the very least, when we finish, we'd finish together in heaven. Stay faithful to the Lord, no matter how easy or hard it may be, for there is no greater joy than the reunion of people who've stayed faithful to Christ. Verses 5 through 8 introduce a very important principle for all of us to know or remember, and that's that an evidence of a godly walk is a generous heart. An evidence of a godly walk is a generous heart. An open hand. Well, if you're going to ask us for money, I'm going to ask you to give your stuff away, but not to me, not to the church, to the Lord. If he tells you, hang on to it, save it, then save it. If he tells you to take somebody to lunch, take them to lunch. If he tells you to pay to fix someone's car, pay to fix someone's car. If he tells you to use it to bless your family with a vacation, go on vacation. But that you take what you have, recognize who gave it to you, and give it back to him. Gaius used what he had to bless the people in his life as the Lord led. And an evidence of a godly walk is a generous heart. He most certainly was one who practiced what he professed. Now, you consider this guy, Mr. Gaius, <laughs> he was not a respecter of persons. As you read through this, and look here, verse 5 and 6, Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers. He wasn't a respecter of persons. Like, well, I only help the cool people. I don't like the nerdy people. I, I only help my friends. I don't help the strangers. Or I only, oh my goodness, whether they were brethren he knew by name or they were visitors coming in in the name of Christ, it didn't matter. 
It didn't matter. James blasts something called partiality amongst the church. If you've never read the book of James, check out chapter 2. He spends a healthy amount of time just absolutely ridding the church of partiality or having favorites. People would show up all dressed too impressed and the wealthy ones, rings and blinging, and, and you'd go, ooh, you can have the seat of honor. You come over here. And people who would come walking in from far away, clothes tattered, they were poor beggars or slaves. You, you guys can sit in the back room. You know, outside's really nice. He says, what is wrong with you? God does not judge with partiality at all. There's no one he wouldn't have died for. He died for the whole world. To be guilty of partiality is to be guilty of trespasses, James says. Now, love, the kind of love that John's writing about, is a love that is including real charity. It's not, I hope you have a good day. It helps people have a good day. Good wishes are good wishes. And I think, hey, God bless you. Hope you have a good day. But if you have the opportunity to help someone have a good day, we ought to take the opportunity. What's fascinating about a generous heart that comes from a godly walk, it's not about the size, it's about the obedience to the moment. Giving a kid a piece of gum all the way out to helping someone with some ginormous problem, helping people shovel snow or get out of the ditch, it doesn't matter that you would give of your time and your resources as the Lord leads. And it's so neat. There's a, a, a statement here where there's this joint partnership. He says, you send them that they didn't have to come begging. They didn't have to come wanting. These missionaries or traveling evangelists would come into town and you'd let them stay with you and you'd feed them and support them. And then it was time to go. You weren't just like, have a good trip. It's like, let me go to the gas station and put some fuel in your tank. Or, hey, I bought you a bag of snacks or whatever it may have been. You supported and encouraged. And when they got to where we were, we picked up where your love left off and loved them and sent them the same. So awesome. Now, you, look, think about how the gospel works amongst the body of Christ. You guys know there was a team that went out a couple months ago to Uganda. Uh, taking two weeks off, and I mean off, off from your work, off from your family, off from your responsibilities, off. How many of you would have had a really hard time finding two weeks to disappear? Almost all of us. And then there was 19-ish people, I think it was, who somehow had the time, but they didn't have the money. Some of you have the money and don't have the time. Think about it. It's God's people with the resource of time, with God's people who have the resource of money, got together to send the gospel of Christ around the world. That's how the church works. It's beautiful. I love the times we've gotten to help people in their moment of trial and despair, and it's so humbling to go in and express, I, I need help. I'm like, you got it. The Bible says that God feeds the birds of the air. He'll take care of you. And sometimes, look, take note. Well, it says that God feeds the birds of the air. He'll take care of people. Yeah, he will. Sometimes through you. Do you have extra 10 bucks in your pocket? Can I just ask, ask God why? Ask God why? He may tell you, go to the movies, have a great day. Then go to the movies, have a great day. He may tell you to feed the guy on the corner. Then feed the guy on the corner. But ask him, why did you give me more than I needed today? And see what he says. Goes on and on in so many different ways. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 9 and 10 is an instruction to you and I, the church, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. If you walk out of here today and you're going to go get lunch and you're like, fine, I guess we'll tip the waiter today. <laughs> First of all, if you go out on Sundays, you better tip huge. You know, Sunday's the worst day for waiters and waitresses because all the Christians are out eating. I'm not joking. It is a known fact amongst waiters and waitresses. Change your mind. Change your mind. I left him a track. Oh my gosh. Better have a hundred dollar bill tucked in it. It was a fake hundred dollar bill. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so you got their hopes up? Be hospitable one to another without grumbling. 
As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. The manifold, it means multidimensional, technicolor grace of God through his people. You're it. Do it. Romans 12, verses 10 and 13, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor, giving preference to one another, distributing to the needs of the saints given to hospitality. You know what's awesome? Some of us by nature are very hospitable. Some of us are not. But your new nature is supposed to be. It just is. There was a young girl growing up, and it's awesome when she retells this story, that her parents went through seasons of difficulty. Her parents went through seasons of blessing. And there was a season of blessing they were in and heard about a particular family. They'd lost their job and fallen on hardship. And when this girl was very young, parents jumped in the car and gave her an envelope, and they pulled up and said, you're going to run up, set it down on the floor, knock on, knock on the door, and take off. She's like, okay. I mean, who doesn't want to ding-dong ditch your, your parents' friends? And so she goes up. She doesn't know what she's doing. Lays it down, knocks on the door, jumps in the car, and peels away. And from a long way off, they could see the family open the envelope and start weeping. They didn't know who it came from, all glory to God. But he had lost his job and didn't know how to make their next house payment. And there it was, showed up just in time. Through who? Through the body of Christ. Now, that's an enormous blessing. Not everyone can do that. But not everyone needs that. Some people just need the moment of eye contact and hello, how are you? Hebrews 13, verses 1 and 2. Let brotherly love continue. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing, by doing so, some have unwittingly entertained angels. Isn't that crazy? I, I can't claim anything, but I can't wait to get to heaven and find it. Like, okay, Lord, where are they at? <laughs> they're either here because they're saved or they're here because they were angels in disguise. I only have two that I'm curious about, but there was a gentleman, it was so awesome, I remember pumping gas, and this homeless guy comes up, and he's like, hey, do you have any money? And I was like, I don't, I only have a card, there's a Del Taco right there, want to have dinner? And he's like, uh, sure, I'm like, cool. So pulled over, went inside, got a bunch of tacos, we're sitting down, and he's like, you know, it's my birthday? I'm like, it's your birthday, and we don't have churros? I'll be right back. Ran in, got two churros. And he starts telling me how faithful God is, how amazing God is. All the stories of God's provision for him while he was homeless. The way he would find the most random stuff that he needed just at the right time, like the birds of the air. How that night he was, he was telling me with genuine joy illuminating from his face how he had found this really cool storm drain that was like 10 degrees warmer than anywhere else outside so he could sleep safe and sound. How is he building me up? And I've never seen him since. Was he a homeless guy? Was he an angel? I don't know. There was another gentleman, I remember, I think about 26 years old. I was brand new at, at being a pastor on staff. And sometimes you would just get assigned random appointments. Hey, you're going to meet with this guy, biblical guidance counseling thing. Okay, cool. Um, oh, he wants to take you to lunch. I'm like, we, we go to lunch with strangers? That's how that works? Cool. Never saw him before in my life. And we go out, I find out, we're sitting down. So what's your name? We start talking. What do you do for work? He's like, I'm a molecular, a molecular biologist. I'm like, oh, I'm an idiot. <laughs> I'm 26 years old. I've been pastoring for like a year. I don't know what's happening. You're brilliant. I'm not. And he just had this question about how salvation and baptism kind of wove together. How, how does that work? I'm like, well, that might be one question I can answer. And then he started sharing. It was amazing. From that point on, the discussion started building me up. He's like, well, according to all these different experiments we've been doing in the molecular biological realm, uh, did you know it actually proves the, the dimensions and structure and engineering that the book of Revelation gives on the New Jerusalem and all these? I'm like, what? <laughs> and I never, I never saw him at church before, and I never saw him at church after. I saw him one more time four years later on an airplane in Texas. 
sitting there. This guy's walking down the aisle. You know, he's buckling up. And he's like, Pastor David? I'm like, y'all. Yeah. It's like four years ago. I'm like, mm-hmm. You know, you're pretending. Oh, yeah. And he's like, we had lunch together. You, you talked about baptism with me. I'm like, oh, oh, my gosh. Where are you at? He's like, I'm right in the back. I'm like, oh, okay. When the plane takes off, I want to come talk with you. Plane takes off. I walked up and down that plane four or five times, couldn't find him to save my life. I, you're saying it's an angel? I'm saying, I don't know. I'm saying the Bible says you better be careful because God might be spying on you closer than you think. <laughs> Worst case scenario, it builds you up and blesses them. And maybe you've entertained angels. What is it? What is the whole point? You have older John building up a young man who is being punched and put down for being godly by an ungodly man. Are you building other people up in the faith? Do it prayerfully, but with great encouragement and intentionality. And if we're to have a mature godly walk, we're going to have to have a mature, generous heart. I want to close with this before we spend some time in worship. And, I, and remember, for this month, we're going to spend just extra time in worship at the end of the studies. You can stay seated. You can kneel. You can stand. But let's just be with the Lord in worship this month a little bit more than normal. But speaking of all this generosity, think of how generous God has been. Think of how generous God has been. He gives us daily our daily bread. And sometimes we even forget to thank him for it. We take it for granted. He gives peace to an anxious mind, at least when we ask for it. Comfort to the brokenhearted. And even his only begotten son, in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Think of how generous God has been. It's amazing. This world's so temporary, and the time is almost up. May we end up day by day being less like ourselves and more like the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to draw near to you as we have in study right now in prayer for a little while in worship. And God, whether we sit and meditate right now and just think on your goodness If we stand in praise and in worship, Lord, I ask that you would minister to the hearts and minds of your people. Those that are growing weary, Lord, you'd fill them with renewed strength to stick it out. If any of us have become too tight-fisted on our stuff, Lord, humble us with the cross and how gracious you have been. And today, look, if you don't know the Lord, He invites you to. He invites you to know Him. It says, any who would come to Him by faith, trusting in the name of Christ, His death upon the cross and the resurrection from the dead, you shall be saved. Trust in Him and stick it out. Lord, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.